So the next speaker uh, doesn't need a lot of introduction to this audience. Uh, John Lockwood, he's been associated with this conference um, for a long time. Uh, he has been a faculty member at uh, Washington University where he led the reprogrammable uh, network architecture group. I'm not sure that was the acronym. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's led the NetFPGA team at Stanford and he's now with Algologic. He will talk about uh, network acceleration as well, but in the context of a specific uh, domain of um, high-speed trading. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so thank you. So for the talk, I want to give an introduction to high frequency trading. Uh, I'll give a survey of some of the software and hardware and hybrid approaches that's being used on Wall Street today. Talk about our approach, which uses field programmable gate arrays to do HFT, and some of the advantages and the disadvantages of using FPGAs. And then talk about the low latency library that we've implemented and have running and deployed with the NetFPGA 10G platform. So that was our Stanford open platform uh, that we built. Uh, that was the second version of it. And we'll show how that was used to do some exposure and position tracking applications. Talk about what protocols are supported and give results from the deployment. So high frequency trading is trading of equities, options, futures, at high speeds and large volumes. Uh, the idea is to earn money by exploiting these fleeting variations in stock prices, is that uh, it only takes a small amount at a high volume in order to, to make money. So HFT actually accounts for over 70% of all the trades in the US markets in 2010, and it's more now. And so it's a large part of, of what happens on, in the market. And it involves using computers to place orders based on predefined algorithms. And so HFT is based on using computers and taking the human out of the trading process, or the human guiding the, the high-level operation, but then using machines to execute. So some of the main challenges for the financial markets is latency. Being able to execute orders faster than other investors is what makes the ability to earn money. And the other aspect is jitter, is that you need to provide a consistent and fair execution time for the trades. Secondary considerations are throughput, is you have to handle a large volume of orders, and then flexibility, which is you have to be able to adapt to handle different strategies and different risk patterns that can come up. So some of the recent problems that happened with high frequency trading uh, just recently was what we call the nightmare, uh, night capital. And so what happened with, in the nightmare was that night capital had some test scripts that they were running on their, in the development lab, which was to test that they were a market maker. And in order to test their market making is that they had these test scripts that would buy and sell against their other software, which was doing the market making. And they did a software update one morning a few weeks ago, and they went over to the deployed network, and the script was still running, that somebody forgot to, to go into the cron job or turn off the script that was running. They lost $450 million in 45 minutes. Uh, it put the company nearly out of business uh, through scavenging money from some of their uh, customers and it, they became investors. Basically, they transferred the entire ownership of the company over over the weekend so that they could open up on Monday morning. Uh, otherwise, it would have been a, a nightmare for the SEC to deal with and clean up. And so, um, so that, that was one problem. Uh, NASDAQ, the Facebook IPO, another disaster, is that in this case, uh, there was $62 million in direct damages on the day that Facebook launched its IPO because they couldn't price the IPO that morning. They couldn't compute what price it should start trading at. And they didn't give the order execution reports back to the people that had placed the orders. And so as a result, no one knew what they owned when Facebook went public. And that was a big problem because Facebook stocks start off at, what, $42 on, on the first day of the IPO? And it's fallen to less than $19 today. And so how quickly you can get rid of that stock, which what everyone was trying to do, was what made it money. And so, uh, so NASDAQ has a, is, is likely uh, and they're in final negotiations with the SEC over this, but is likely to, to pay out $62 million to make up for uh, their software glitch that they had as a result of this. 
Um, another problem was with the BATS failure, is that a software bug in the order auctions uh, for BATS was doing their IPO that day. Um, and that on the day of launching their IPO, they, they screwed up trading not only of their own stock, but all the A's and B's. They also screwed up Apple. And so as you can imagine, for Apple shareholders, were more than a little bit upset when they started having wide price fluctuations. Uh, and it, as, as a result, they were forced to cancel their IPO on that same day and refund all the money the next day. So that basically put that company also lost out on a lot. But I think the biggest problem with all this is that this HFT uh, has not only hurt the banks and institutions, I mean, it's the direct loss, you know, half a billion dollars just from these alone, but, but it also really hurts the credibility of the market. When people lose trust in the market, they stop using it. And so a lot of people don't like HFT because they feel that it's, uh, it's not trustworthy, that there's glitches, that a software problem can take down the whole market. Um, and I think that's, that's the biggest problem that has to be solved. And so, in terms of solving problems, is that we can look at hardware solutions and software solutions. And let's we'll start with the software solutions. So first of all, uh, with most of the trading happens uh, with NIC cards. And so with Linux, if you take an unoptimized NIC card, um, you can get kind of typical round trip times of 15 to 20 microseconds, um, or for half round trip times, through an unoptimized kernel. So if you don't do anything, uh, and just put a NIC in your host is that you can get those kind of round-trip times. If you use an optimized TCP offload, you can get numbers down to like 2.9 microseconds transmit, um, 6 microseconds receive. Now you can do better with software. You can use techniques like datagram bypass layer and get down to say 3.5 microseconds for UDP, 4 microseconds for TCP. Uh, and then of course there's also the InfiniBand group of the MPI that can get down to you know, microsecond level times um, although that excludes the application layer, is that you have to add some time for the processing that it takes uh, to actually perform the operation that you need to do. Uh, on the hardware approach is that there's graphic processors, GPUs, but GPUs are really optimized for throughput. Um, they're doing they're big, long, deep vector machines that are optimized to push a lot of numbers through. So that they're not well optimized for latency. And plus, you have to go across the PCI Express bus in order to talk to them. And so uh, the combination of those two um, GPUs are used on Wall Street, but they're not used for, for trading. Uh, there's also ASICs, and of course ASICs achieve sub-microsecond latency, uh, but the problem is they don't have the flexibility to handle different protocols and features. And so uh, how Wall Street trades and what trades work changes on a daily or weekly basis or daily basis. And so it would be difficult to build a business case around building ASICs for Wall Street because you would obsolete your chip before it got fabricated. And so that that doesn't work well. FPGAs uh, have the benefit, much like ASICs, where you can get the latency down, to, you know, the point, 0 0.2 microseconds with TCP, for example, of processing pa TCP packets. And you also have the flexibility to change and support different protocols and features. And so uh, FPGAs seem to be a pretty promising technique uh, for doing trading on Wall Street. It's a technique that almost all the firms now are using. And so in the last two or three years, um, every company on Wall Street has started using FPGAs. And we've been involved with them through that process. So let's look at, on the FPGA side, there's a few ways you can do FPGA computing. You can use what you might call the hybrid computing model. Um, and so the hybrid computing model is a combination of having the CPU plus a NIC plus the FPGA offload engine. And so for here, the packets come in. Uh, they can go through the FPGA and they're passed up through a NIC. They go through the driver, they go through the OS or sometimes bypass through the OS because you might have an OS bypass and then make their way up to the application running for the financial application. Um, so the issues with the hybrid computing is that sometimes you get unpredictable PCI Express bus transfer times. So if you're a PCIe card, um, you may have other transactions that are contending for that. You may have a memory copy. Um, you may have a cache miss, and then you also have Amdahl's law, which means that although the FPGA may give you some parallelism, you may also have some sequential execution, which dominates the total execution time. So another model is the pure FPGA computing model, which is what if you could do everything on the FPGA? Um, and so that way you could avoid the bus copy, you could avoid the memory copy, you would have no cache misses, and it would be all parallel execution. And so um, 
you know, just as a graph of this, of thinking, if you look at a, a chart of what the processing time is versus um, the number of messages, so th this is basically a distribution plot that shows two things. It's showing latency and showing jitter. And so on the latency side, the latency side is how much time it takes to process a message. And so with software, for example, you might have on average, say, a five microsecond delay um, for processing a, a packet. But you may also have some jitter, which means sometimes it's a little faster, like two microseconds. Sometimes it's a little slower, like seven microseconds. And so the spread, the width of this curve, is the, is the jitter. And so um, whereas with hardware, you can get that latency down to about two-tenths of a microsecond, so 200 nanoseconds, by going through a few clock cycles of pipeline stages. And you, you effectively have no jitter. Uh, the only jitter you have is on which phase of the clock did you arrive. And so if you're running at, say, 156 megahertz, you might have a six nanosecond jitter based on if you showed if the packet came across the asynchronous link just before or after the, the clock edge. Otherwise, it's a deterministic edge. And so you get a very tight bound on the latency. And you also start off with a small number. Big problem, though, with FPGAs uh, is another way to look at what happens with uh, building FPGAs is the latency that you can achieve versus how long did it take you to get your product to market. So this is a time development time and market. This is measured in hours, days, weeks, months, years. Uh, so this is the logarithmic plot on this scale. Uh, latency um, starts off this way. And so a benefit of software solutions, clearly, is that it takes less time to get started is that, that within a matter of hours, you can be up in GCC, make, compile, run. You can be running in applications and software. Um, and so that's a benefit. But it's hard to get the latency down. And so you can go back and optimize your code. You know, GCC minus 05, um, that's one step. You can use a better software algorithm to, to tune it and tweak it. But you, you kind of hit a diminishing returns point after a while, which means that no matter how much you keep banging on your code, it's not going to get any faster. And so even if you spend a year or two on it, you're still only slightly faster than you were before. And so with FPGAs, the, the problem they have is this, this generally takes a long time to get your first FPGA circuit working. And so that it may be weeks or months or years before you have your app running on the FPGA. But once you get there, you start off with a lot less latency. Uh, and so that you've got this inherent advantage of being faster, it's just that it took you longer to get to market. Now, you may be out of the market by the time you get this device. <coughs> Traditionally, a lot of companies that have tried doing this, uh, if they didn't get to market in time, they had lost out because someone else was eating their lunch by trading with software before them. So we put together a library of trying to get to market faster and we call that the low latency library. And so it's a, a couple of pieces of some infrastructure, some prot protocol parsers, and then also keeping market data in local memory. And so a block diagram of the whole system is here, and we'll go through some of the pieces. So starting off with the infrastructure, uh, so the infrastructure that we have is includes uh, some of the 10 gigabit Ethernet max, and so these are uh, Xilinx uh, components. But then our part is all of the IP packet processing, the session and datagram processing, uh, plus an interface so that you can control and configure the FPGA from software. And so we still have uh, the user at software setting up the connections and <coughs> configuring how they want to uh, have the operate, you know, which flows and sessions belong to which traders. Uh, and so we have a C++ API that you can write to and it sends messages down through a standard NIC and they get read into the register interface so we can set up and control and configure the device um, in a pretty standard way. Um, there's also protocol parsers. So in order to be on the stock exchange, it depends on which stock exchange that you're on. So the, the most common exchange language is what's called FIX, the Financial Information Exchange. And that's actually a text-based protocol where you lay out uh, with different text fields, field equals value, um, tuple, or key, key value pairs, um, what your trade is. Uh, but then there's a number of binary protocols. And so on NASDAQ, they use what's called OUCH. On, uh, with XPRS is used for direct edge. In Chicago, it's BATS. There's Arca Direct for NYSE. Uh, and then in London, it's the London Stock Exchange. And so we've set up, uh, really, I'd say our biggest contribution is that we've set up protocol parsers that handle all of the major exchanges so that we can parse out and extract and uh, make decisions on stock orders 
um, over a number of different protocol formats they come in on. This is all being done in the FPGA hardware. So just as a kind of a graphic view of what this looks like is that uh, if you look inside the FPGA, uh, like with a model sim waveform or an iSIM waveform, uh, you would see an ALCH packet. So this is a NASDAQ order coming in that has a 14-byte order token, a buy sell, the number of shares, the stock name, and a price. And so, um, but what we see on the FPGA is these are clock cycles on a 64-bit bus. And so that's one, two, three clock cycles. Uh, so that as the packet streaming through, we're just picking off the fields that make up the order and then uh, making a decision on what to do based on that. Um, okay, and the last thing is for stock market price and tables is that sometimes the decision you have to make is based on what price uh, the stock's trading at. And so that we maintain, use local memory on the FPGA, so this is the block RAM, BRAM, that gets used to store stock price tables in a, in a compact hash format. And so we have market data updates that come in. And so market data also gets sent over the internet and can be uh, populated into this table. So what we did with this, the reason for doing this was by building this a pre-built library that has all the parsing and the infrastructure and the market data components, the idea was to get, we moved this line to the left. And that's really all we did, is that we took this pre-built library and instead of being weeks or months or years to get a product to market, we moved it to the left by having a library that got us there and a new customer can get there in days or weeks. And so, but it still has the benefit of the FPGA solution, meaning that it's got the low latency data path. Uh, and so from the starting point then, we, we start off at this green point here, which would be at still a slightly longer time to market. Um, you could get there faster in software, but a lower latency in general, um, in a more consistent latency. So we've been working with different areas of applications, and so uh, kind of the people that use this are traders, uh, brokers, market makers, and exchanges. And so some of the applications of having this mapped into FPGA hardware is that we can do things like trading strategy, and so that would be the algorithmic trading itself, um, feed processing, risk management, and so for risk management, making sure that orders that go into the stock market are sane, meaning that those orders are uh, within the ranges that they should be, that a customer is not overextending, that software, some errant software process running on a machine isn't injecting bogus orders. Uh, you can stop that just by having a, an extra 200 nanoseconds of latency. You can verify that you never had that nightmare happen because you could have been checking to make sure that you weren't putting silly orders in. I mean, of course, you could have not run the software script in the first place, but if you had this extra risk check process there, you could have made sure that that software process didn't bring down the company. And so we think that for people that are doing compliance or, or trying to mitigate the threat that your IT person brings your company down on a Monday morning is that you could have an extra system, an extra FPGA card, a little net FPGA 10G card, just checking to make sure that crazy things aren't happening. Uh, other things, smart order routing, um, you could do matching, internalization, a number of different things that might be useful. So the operations, again, that we do in hardware, we put together a demo um, in, as a way to show what the, what's going on is we can, we're parsing fixed execution reports and maintaining uh, on a per security basis and on a per flow basis, a session basis, looking at what the long exposure, the short exposure, uh, value per security across all sessions and position per security across all sessions by having all these trades pass through a, a NetFPGA 10G card, and then um, on a periodic basis, showing on a dashboard to the end customer what's going on. And so, for example, this is the, da this is the dashboard that runs on the GUI, is this is showing, for example, you've got a group of algorithmic traders uh, at a firm that are trading, and all of their orders are, the fixed orders were going through to be executed on the exchange, but passing through this card, and as they pass through, making sure, looking at what exposure that they were putting the company at risk at. And so this dashboard would, would have, had Knight Capital had a dashboard like this, they would have seen uh, within five seconds or two seconds or one second, uh, it takes a little bit longer for the, the GUI to update, but they would have seen that their, their exposure positions would have been highly out of whack. And that, uh, so that's, and the setup is that it would be beneficial for 
uh, we think for an end trader or an end firm to be monitoring the risk instead of letting it go for 45 minutes unabated when 45 minutes later they realize they lost $450 million. Um, so some of the specifications of performance numbers, um, again, based this implementation was on the NetFPGA 10G. Um, a mundane card by today's performance requirements is that this was something we did a couple of years ago back at Stanford. Uh, the application was this position and exposure calculation protocol fix 4.2. A small number of sessions, 10 sessions. Um, this, this was just doing 100 securities. That was the limit of what we could show on the, on the GUI graph. Uh, internally, we have also done implementations that have tables that contain every traded symbol on the market um, for equities. Um, clock frequency, so this is line rate, 10 gigabits per second. Our processing latency, 200 nanoseconds. Uh, that's our logic uh, extracting the messages. Uh, there is a 10 gig phi delay. Some of the FPGAs, the CERTES, uh, are not as well optimized as they could be. And so looking at extracting from pin to pin, which is often a common metric, is that about a microsecond of pin to pin latency. So the results are um, that we implemented this FPGA gateway to do order flow processing. Um, it parses all the protocols for major exchanges. It maintains the market data in local memory. Demonstrated this with 10 sessions of FIX 4.2 on the NetFPGA 10G and achieved uh, effectively jitter-free performance, uh, 6 nanoseconds, within a t with a 200 nanosecond latency of processing delay. So for more details, uh, there's a lot more details on the website that can go in and talk about which protocols are supported and what it does. So that's on the website. Uh, and then also, we're here to talk with people. And uh, our office actually is located just three blocks away. Um, we relocated from Palo Alto a year ago. And so uh, we're just on the other side of NVIDIA. And so uh, in our lab here, we have set up, for example, our, this is our 10 gigabit stock trading setup. And so from here, we can simulate and test market conditions of placing orders and do verification scripts. So we take machines, and before they get deployed into Wall Street, we do full system testing, and then just drop ship the boxes off to, up to the data centers in, in New Jersey. So um, that's it. Thanks.